Namu tasa bhagavato arahato samma Namu tasa namu tasa bhagavato arahato samma Namu tasa namu tasa bhagavato arahato samma Namu tasa Bhutang tamang sankhang namasami So our real abidance is in the silence, which is natural, and space, space and silence. So then this reflection for today is the taking the witness position. And a witness is not a judge, so it's not a to criticize anything but to be aware of it the way it is right now in this present moment. So in the Thai forest tradition that we learn from Lung Par Cha and various other Ajahns, the, the Puto, the witness, when we take refuge in Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, and this can be just a ceremonial traditional form that we use. <clears throat> but when we take refuge, this is my version anyway, is a being a witness, being the Buddha, the Puto, aware of the Dhamma, because in this traditional form, Pali Buddhism, the Buddha knows the Dhamma. And the Sangha is those who practice in this in this proper way so the witness then is suddenly the word buddha and bhuto become something much more practical than just uh, concepts that we read about or regard in terms of historical buddhas and and how we might use that word in belief do you believe in buddha or do you don't you don't believe in Buddha? But taking refuge in awareness, that's the Buddha position, the witness of the Dhamma, the way things are. <laughs> so then when we say Bhutang Saranangatami, we you know, I take refuge in the Buddha. What is you know, in a practically what does that mean right now for any of us? is, uh, you know, the the practical version is the witness position to the way things are, the Dhamma. And the Dhamma, all conditions are impermanent. Sapa, Sankaranita, all conditions are impermanent. That's without exception. So it's a, it's a statement not a dogma, to be reflected upon from the Buddhist position, the Buddha position. So then this is the right practice. This is what Sangha really amounts to. It's not just a a bhikkhu Sangha or, you know, however you want to use that word. It's one who's practicing rightly or properly. So these are the refuges. Refuges, you know, the English word refuge is you go to a refuge to be feel safe, a safe place to be. So when we take refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, then this uh, this is uh, you know this can be merely ceremonial, as it oftentimes is in our lives, or when we reflect on it, what does it really mean? What is, how practical is it? Is it? Do we believe in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, or 
can we just believe that's just Buddhist Thai tradition and dismiss it? You know, we have different attitudes towards ceremonies or or Theravada Buddhism. These opinions and views or prejudices or biases can be witnessed to. So it's not that you have to believe in Buddha and Dhamma Sangha as your refuge. That's not the point of this re reflection. But how to use those terms, their words in themselves, coming from ancient Indian language, Pali language. And for most of us who weren't born in, into Buddhist families or in Buddhist countries, then, you know, Buddhism is, we're adopting Buddhist terms like we take refuge in the Dhamma. And we, what does that really mean, refuge in the Dhamma? You know, so we, and then we try to translate that as absolute reality, ultimate reality. We have to use superlative English words to convey the Dhamma. But what is absolute reality at this moment? Ultimate reality right now. And this is where you, you take the position of the witness, the Bhutto. And of course, the first when you hear these kind of talks, you know, your mind goes blank. What is, you know, when I say, what is a, what is Puto practically right now at this very moment for all of us? And then notice how one's mind goes quite empty because you're trying to think and figure it out in terms of words, concepts again. Absolute reality is about as good as you can get in English translations. But still, they're just empty words. What is ultimate reality or absolute reality at this moment? And then we think these, these are very high concepts. And um, we see Dhamma as something very high up. You know, so we think it's, it, uh, we identify with our bodies completely. And so we see all kinds of, our critical mind it registers all kinds of, uh, pro of problems, defects, weaknesses, mistakes, problem, personal problems, emotional problems physical problems, psychological problems. We see ourselves always as, as physical forms with problems. There's something wrong with us. We've got to solve these problems. And all this is our words in the present moment. If you see yourself as someone who's unenlightened, unaware, with a lot of personal problems, then you, you know, that. what is that right now in the present moment in terms of Dhamma? And taking the witness position means that you're a witness to what you're thinking. If you believe, really believe yourself as someone with a lot of problems, then you're a witness to that. Those are views you have about your personality, your physical appearance, yourself as a personality, and and then we can always find fault with the conditioned realm that we identify with. There's plenty th plenty to go wrong in it. You know, the conditioned realm, the dualistic realm, good and evil, right and wrong, true and false, is you know it shifts from good to bad to right to wrong and easily these words convey uh, you know the the best and the worst. But the reality of here and now 
it's not about the best. You're feeling at your best or your worst. It's like this. So the worst, you're feeling the worst at this moment. It's like this. And that's a witnessing. You're witnessing it the way it is as you experience it in the present moment. But your refuge is in the witness, not in the view that you feel bad or terrible. So taking refuge in the Buddha then is a good reminder. You know, what is that? What is that? How do we do that? And how practical is it if you don't know what the Buddha really is or you you still believe Buddha is a is a body, is a historical figure, or is a Buddha Rupa a figure of the Buddha? Then we project the word Buddha onto historical images or foreign objects and and uh, think of Buddha as uh, you know as some ideal form. So then, the Buddha is no it isn't really have a form. It's awareness here and now that's available to all of us. So then I emphasize taking a stand with this witnessing position. Taking a stand with something, is, is trusting what, you know, in awareness that you, right now, whatever you're feeling, physically, emotionally, you, you didn't ask for it. This is what, what happens in various situations when conditions come together, you feel like this. So you're not you're not creating anything, you know, like uh, the the present moment. The present moment is the way it is. It's like this. And then that recognizing Dhamma is the way things are. The conditioned realm that we identify with is impermanent. And that's its true nature. It it can't be any other way. We can say just the, the bodies that we have, they once they're born, they just grow up and get older. And there's no way to stop that. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not that it should be otherwise, but it's, you know, we suffer when we, when we want it to not get old, not to get sick, not to die. Then... We create suffering because we're no longer witnessing the way it is. We're just judging, you know, according to what we want, desire of these physical forms. We want them to be healthy and young-looking, good-looking, strong, and all these very positive uh, words that we have in the, in the language we speak. We don't want them to be ugly and weak and sickly and frail and and uh, disabled and I'm like that. So we, you know, there's what we want, what we don't want. But the way it is isn't about wanting, you know, it's not wanting it to be the way it is, but it's, this is where you trust and abide in this awareness, the witness position in the present. And it's a very strong position if you really trust it. So in using this word trust in you know is is more you know it's learning to to uh, put your trust in something that's here and now rather than in some ideal you may have about the, what you want to happen in the future or in some other person, or in a political system, or a religion. You know, so when we try to trust external conditions, they change in. So it's, uh, you know, it's, that's their nature. And then we're going to be disappointed, because 
we put our faith, our trust, our soul into depending on something that is very unstable and going to change and usually not the way we would like it to change. So Puto, the witnessing, taking the stand with the Buddha, the, the witnessing position. You, you know, if you don't feel you're, you can, you're the Buddha, that's fine because we're not Buddhas. We're not, you know, as personal identities. But refuge in Buddha is refuge in conscious awareness here and now. Dhamma, when we chant Santitiko Dhamma, Kaliko Dhamma, apparent here and now and timeless. And that's this very moment here and now. So the meditation also in the West, there's so many views and opinions about how to practice. And then, of course, uh, you know, this is, you know, you, you have to do this in order to get that. And and then we can see uh, that the Panyavimuti star, the wisdom approach, is oftentimes overlooked for more or less trying to develop something you want or something you, you've been told that you should get. So a lot of disappointment in, in putting our trust in what scriptures say or teachers say just without witnessing what we're doing. So our trust is in awareness because that's here and now, whatever whatever you're doing, whatever you're feeling in the present moment is like this, is a fair enough use of English words. Because at this moment, the conditioned realm can only be this way. We didn't make it this way. It's not like we want it to stay like this forever. But at this moment, it's like this. In here in uh, Temple Forest Monastery in the Sala, crowded room, it's like this. Listening to, to me, reflecting on Dhamma, it's like this. So this, this way of reflecting on Dhamma is presenting Dhamma in a way you, you're not uh, demanding belief in it. It's not like we're trying to convert you to being Buddhists or convince you to become monks or nuns. But it is a way of, of giving forth directions which are very useful and very realistic in terms of what we call Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism, Pali Buddhism. Now, we're educated. In America, people are usually quite well educated, so you've learned a lot. You've acquired a lot of knowledge about things with the information age, the internet, and and so forth. There's so much available information. Some ways of practicing meditation, different forms of Buddhism, different religious traditions, and in some ways it's very good because you know the great wise teachings are now readily available on the internet, which was which is a fairly recent event. But the, when we talk about the gradual approach or the instantaneous realization, then we become confused. You know, we think it has to be gradual. And the instant, you know, seems impossible from the personal way of thinking. Immediate enlightenment here and now seems impossible according to a way we've been conditioned to think. 
about religion, about Buddhism. And the gradual approach is oftentimes very personal, like uh, have you attained samadhi and you, you've got to get jhanas, you've got to develop these qualities, uh, the baramitas and and so forth. So the, the kind of uh, emphasis on acquiring virtues and and uh, level high levels of concentration are usually taken very personally. And I remember when I was a layman in Bangkok, I lived in Bangkok for six months before I ordained, and uh, the Buddhist, uh, the uh, expatriate Buddhist group in Bangkok at the time had so many views and opinions about who is an enlightened teacher, who isn't. And oftentimes Thai people thought because we're, I was educated that I should study Abhidhamma. So I went to an Abhidhamma class at one of the main temples in Bangkok with a teacher who was giving talks in English. And it just presented me with more vocabulary. And I spent many years being educated, learning more words, more concepts, and reading so much about Buddhism from different traditions that the last thing I wanted was just more vocabulary. So then the Anjan Cha approach, which was this emphasis on witnessing was exactly what I felt, you know, was a, what I really needed. It was practical because I could do that in a situation that was frustrating when you're the first Western bhikkhu in a very conservative traditional form of Buddhism, you know, coming from the West Coast. California to Ubu and Rajatani, Northeast Thailand, to a very traditional monastery, you know, it's, you, you know, it's very frustrating because you don't know what the language or the culture. But the trust in the witnessing position, I could relate to because I could, you know, use my frustration, my feeling frustrated, feeling lonely, feeling misunderstood, feeling suspicious, paranoid. I felt all these kind of reactions going through the training process for the first year. But Lumpur Cha's emphasis on Puto, on witnessing what I was feeling, he wasn't preaching at me, like telling me how I should feel and, and you know, how wonderful the tradition is and the grateful and so forth. Uh, but it was much more encouragement to take the stand of the witness, the puto. So frustration or paranoia is like this. Suddenly I had a way of looking and accepting what I was feeling without trying to do anything about it. Where my personality was very much based on Western psychology where you've got to fix it. If you're feeling paranoid, there's something wrong with you. You, you know, the normal person isn't paranoid. And on and on like that, so you form views about what nor a normal human being is, and uh, and then you you feel abnormal, and that can be witnessed too. Feeling abnormal is like this. Suddenly you're you're letting go of what you're feeling. You're not trying to get rid of it, but you're not making a problem about it. You're not adding to it proliferating with it, like I, I should be grateful, I should be, you know, have appreciation for this ancient tradition and all the shoulds that, that I already, you know, acquired, 
because it's natural for me to to know how I should feel and and such a fine teacher and a and a kind of impeccable tr- tradition as I witnessed at Wat Pa Poem. So I knew how I should feel as as an ideal, as as a bhikkhu, as a student, as a disciple. But I didn't always feel that way, and so so the witnessing position is not telling, is not critical, not saying you should you should feel a certain way all the time. But feeling is like this experience here and now. Whatever, however you, whatever you're experiencing at this moment can only be the way it is. And you rest in and abide in the puto, in the awareness of it, rather than trying to change it or judge it or suppress it or just follow it. So in this way of witnessing, then we can deal with the conditioned realm, with the physical bodies we have, with the emotional habits we've acquired. Because they're objects that we can witness to. We, we're not the body, so we can witness the body. We're not the emotions we're feeling of love and hate, like or dislike. But we're the witness, the puto, the witness to love and hate. A f- attachment to views. We have strong views about what's politically right and what's politically wrong, or about religion, about class, about race, about gender. All these views, we can, you know, these are views that we cling to. We can actually witness them. They are the way they are. It's not about right view as something that is uh, words and attitudes that are permanently right. The right view is, is, a, is a static thing. But right view, samaditi, right understanding, is the witnessing, seeing that all conditions, all phenomena, Everything is impermanent, and we're witnessing impermanence rather than trying to uh, change it or make it go the way we want or try to destroy it. So when we do this, when we take the puto position of witnessing, it's impersonal. It's not like I'm uh, Ajahn Sumedho is witnessing the present moment even though that's the way it might seem. But witnessing is impersonal because it's conscious awareness, which is not something that you create. It's not cultural. It's not religious. It's natural. It's Dhamma. The reality of here and now all the all the, the these conditions that we're experiencing in this moment are changing, and so the puto position is witnessing the dhamma, the changingness of conditioned phenomena. And of course, we rather than spending our time always looking outward to the, the ch- season is changing, is getting towards autumn, and uh, time is changing and things are changing, climate is changing, everything's changing. And uh, when we take that personally, then it's, we can, we don't, we'd like to have a kind of permanent spring or, you know, long summer days and short nights, or we have preferences that we're attached to. Not that they're right or wrong, but they're not dhamma, they're just conditions that we create in our mind, that we cling to and hold to without knowing what we're doing. It becomes just that we're victims of habit.
So over the years, reflecting in this way, suddenly Buddha Dhamma Sangha, rather than just some adopting them in uh, intellectually, you know, and the one thing about Pali Buddhism intellectually is quite pleasing. It makes sense. It's logical. <clears throat> and so uh, Buddhism in its various forms can be, you know, level on the intellect can be very pleasing to us. But if we only keep it on that level, then we get bored with it. Because it's changing. Or we see things, you know, we go to monasteries, we meet different teachers, and we can find fault with them. So I lost my faith in Buddhism when I witnessed this monk smoking a cigarette or something. <laughs> and uh, people do that. They, you know, they expect monks to be living examples of Buddhas, perfected forms. So when we project onto religious traditions, you know, all our ideals, you know, we we can delude ourselves a lot of the time, but then there are moments where we we see things we don't agree with or don't like, and then we can lose faith. But trust isn't it isn't about faith, it's about Trusting in Dhamma is awareness itself, which is always available. When we become disillusioned, it's like this. If I become disillusioned with something, I witness it. So I remember I became interested in Buddhism uh, in the 1950s in Japan, and it was in uh, Zen Buddhism. And then Alan Watts had published the book, The Way of Zen. And so that was a bestseller at the time in 1955 or 56. And, and so I purchased that. And then I idolized Alan Watts as an enlightened master. And then I found out he was alcoholic. <laughs> and then my faith in Alan Watts dropped. And so this is, and, and at the time I didn't have the wisdom to see what I was doing. And, uh, you know, I just, you know, I believed that if he was really enlightened, he wouldn't, you couldn't possibly be alcoholic. So um, then, you know, you can't trust him. He's, he's a good speaker very gifted speaker, you give him credit for that, but kind of in, in a patronizing way. <laughs> and then, and then uh, uh, you, you dismiss actually what he's actually pointing at in his writings, in his talks. So in monastic life in Thailand, I remember um, one of the senior monks at the time, uh, I kind of idolized, and he was so good at everything. You know, he was really mindful and, and on the ball and, and was very active, and Ajahn Chah seemed to trust him completely, and so I was, I kind of idolized this senior monk. And then I, that Pansa, after Pansa, Lung Pa Cha invited me and another monk, a senior monk, to go on a trip to meet the various uh, Ajans, famous Kuba Ajans in Northeast Thailand. So we were going in a, in a, in a car and um, before we went, you know, I was quite happy. You know, it was a real opportunity to be with Ajahn Chah and meet these various teachers at the time that were alive, disciples of Lung Phu Man. 
And, uh, but then I talked to this senior monk that I idolized and he was jealous. And he said, I work hard for Ajahn Chah and he doesn't invite me. And, and then I lost faith in this senior monk. <laughs> So this was just quoting, you know, referring to examples from my own experience, how on the intellectual level, you're in for a disappointment. Because intellectuality is doesn't feel anything. It's not stable. You, you know, you can easily change your opinion and views and idols that you worship or people that you trust totally can, you can feel betrayed very easily by them because the nature has changed and the ideal idealization of objects is ignorance. There's no ideal monk or ideal tradition, you know, where, where everything is just going to absolutely never sway you, your faith in, in the tradition. Because traditions are, you know, subject to change. Or people we live with, when we're married, or our partners, or whatever our relationship is with others, can change. So, you know, the ideal of romantic love is, is an ideal. And it's very exciting when it happens, but it also changes. And that can be quite disillusioning because we aren't ready to deal with change. We're, we're very much attached to the ideal we held before, before it changed. So unhappiness... Discontentment is the result of this. The changing conditions, earth, fire, water, and air, we divide it into these elements. And I've given many references to these four elements because they're important to, because this is what we identify with, with, with the bodies like, like the earth and the, blood and liquid elements in the body, the fire in the body, the air. All this is, all this is uh, subject to change. The earth, fire, and water, and air have no stability. That's what climate change is doing. It's changing according to conditions. It's supposed to change. And then earth, fire, water, air have no ability to manifest unless there's space. So space is here and now, isn't it? It's a, the apparent here and now space. When we look around, we see the space in the room, the space between people's bodies, the space that we see out the window, and it goes on and on like that. So, so for formed for earth, fire, water, and air to manifest. They have to be in space. And then there's consciousness. So there's these six elements. Consciousness is the substratum of them all. Without consciousness, what, what would be, what would, how could space exist? Or forms in space. So we're getting to Puto, conscious awareness, which is available to each one of us here and now, not some kind of mystical ideal that you've got to get as a person, but something to recognize. So this desana, this talk, is, a, is an encouragement to, to recognize the gift that you have that you don't have to apply for or reach for apparent here and now, timeless. And when you, when you do this, then you, be, you know, at first you, can't, you don't know what it is because 
you want to define it. You're looking for something. You're trying to find pure consciousness as an object. You know, so we, this is where the emphasis on space is important. Important reflection, of awareness of space. Because in every language, there's space around every word. So in, in the thinking process, we don't notice the space between the words. We're caught up in, in uh, grammatical habits that we acquired, where we go from one word to the next according to the grammar that we've learned, and, and we don't notice the space between the words. But when we take refuge in awareness, then we're more interested in the space rather than in the meaning of the words. Like the word Buddha, arises and ceases in consciousness. Consciousness is, is immeasurable. Space is immeasurable. So one way to recognize pure conscious awareness is beginning to, rather than trying to find it or define it as some kind of imagined state that you have that you're not aware of, you give up trying to find it searching for it, or wondering about it, or doubting it, by just observing the puto position. And the words, instead of taking such an interest in the concepts of Buddhism, notice the, the space between the words, the concepts, the Four Noble Truths, even the word the is in space, in consciousness. Conscious, space is in consciousness. The four elements, earth, fire, aware, are in space. Space is in consciousness, but it's consciousness that is our refuge. And when we refer to Buddha or Puto, that's what we mean. Conscious awareness here and now. The Four Noble Truths, fair enough, there's space between every word when you notice it. But if you just think Four Noble Truths, then you don't notice the space. And you go on, what is, what is the First Noble Truth? That we give, I'm giving you an exam, and, and you have to think about the First Noble Truth is suffering and on like that. And so you might pass an examination uh, uh, on Pali Buddhism, but it's still up in the head, in the brain, in the intellect, which can be very interesting and inspiring. But interest and in, interest and inspiration are also changing. It's hard to say interested or inspired by something for a long time. So that's why they're inadequate as refuges, where oftentimes we want inspiration to make us feel good, like romantic love is inspiring, or really feeling an inspiring teacher, or inspiring talk, or an inspired meditation, you know, then that creates the, the you know, we want to feel inspired because that's a very pleasant feeling. But try to sustain inspiration. You know, it's like sugar, it tastes good, but then it, after too much sugar taste, doesn't taste good anymore. You become bored with it, fed up with it, lose interest. So Dhamma then is, is to abide our refuge is in Dhamma. 
And this brutal witness position is what we take in Sangha practice to practice in the right way, the witness of the Dhamma, to know Dhamma. All that is arises must cease. All, con all phenomena is impermanent. All Dhamma is not self. Dhamma, then in this sense, is not personal. Pure consciousness is not personal. It's not something that you, you know, if you claim it as personal achievement, then that's another delusion that you can witness to. So consciousness is impersonal. It's here and now and timeless. So it's in this teaching of letting go, this uh, letting go of conditioned phenomena is not annihilation, it's not nihilistic. We're not trying to get rid of the four elements or trying to get rid of ignorance or trying to get rid of our personal personality or to see our body as some disgusting object because all that is still making it very personal. But in seeing that it's like this. And it's a kind of listening and embracing open awareness that embraces the moment without judging it. So this uh, encouragement <laughs> My last side is very impermanent. <laughs> So when we talk about preaching religion, I'm telling you what's right and wrong and what you should do and think. That's preaching. How I define the word preaching. That you should keep the five precepts, you should be generous and, and uh, you should be mindful and do good and refrain from evil. It's all good preaching. Nothing wrong with that. But what is it? It's, it's preaching, telling you that you're somebody who's got to do something to get to do the good things and refrain from doing the bad things is good advice. But then when we're in the puto position, you know, the preaching no longer, we no longer need to be preached at because we're trusting in awareness, which is knowing that all conditions are impermanent, all Dhamma is not self. This anatta teaching, non-self, ultimate reality is not personal. It's not a person, it doesn't have a form, but it's apparent here and now. And that's what you are, the here and now, is the Dhamma. Because it's a everyone here in the room is experiencing consciousness. It's not just me or the, the bhikkhus. Consciousness is, is, is uh, can't be found as an object, because that's what we are pure, unblemished consciousness is our true nature. And this human birth is, gives us the opportunity to reflect on that. You know, because we have animal bodies, we're mammals, 
we we have this form of an animal and uh, we've got all the desires of an animal for procreating the species for surviving basic conditions of, of the human body, the same as, as the animal world. But then the gift of humanity is, is exemplified in the form of the Buddha, who pointed to the reality that we really are, rather than just an animal caught in the momentum of procreation and survival, we can actually observe the, the procreative tendencies of the urges of the human form or the desire to survive, the fear that we oftentimes feel in life because there's so much to fear on the conditioned realm. It's a fear realm because it's about eating and surviving and uh, we, we need to eat other creatures we need other creatures live on other creatures it's all about survival of the fittest procreating the species and then we identify with that with just the animal forms that we we have rather than reflecting on them So the Buddha pointed the way to reflect on the way things are in terms of the, what we're experiencing through seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking. This is a realm of feeling, you know, like the intellect creates images of perfection. So we have, you know, we grasp these beautiful images of how things should be the perfect relationship, the perfect society, the, you know, the, the uh, utopian world is all a, a brilliant exercise in superlative thinking. But um, that's not the way things are. The conditioned realm is not a superlative. It's a never-changing, unstable, conditioning that we're attaching to and to see that the cause of suffering is this is not that the the the, the condition realm is the cause of suffering it's attachment are 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 attaching to what we're not to the bodies we have to the fears to the desires to the energies of the body that we feel with the emotional habits we've acquired with our cultural conditioning, social conditioning, we have this blind attachment without reflection, understanding the way it is. And that's the cause of suffering. So the insight is to let go, not to get rid of. So letting go is relaxing. Like a tight fist, you, how long can you sustain a tight fist? You know, it creates tension, and you have to give effort. You've got to apply effort to hold it tight. And then the Buddha says, relax, and so you just relax it because you don't get rid of the hand or blame the hand, but you begin to see that relaxed attention, relaxed awareness, is right effort. Where in the Eightfold Path, we oftentimes wonder what right effort is. Samavayamo, what is it? This is an, a common question that people ask. Because in, when we're concentrating on objects, we use a lot of effort. So when we go out to objects, and when we read books, or watch television, or do meditation practice where we're concentrating on objects, we have to put forth effort to do that. And so, when we talk about the Eightfold Path and right effort, 
Samavayama, what is that? And it's relaxed awareness, a sense of ease, being contented. The way things are is like this. And as we trust in this awareness, this practice, then we begin to, to actually realize as you have insight, what we call jnana dasana, profound insight into Dhamma as reality rather than the world that we believe in and we're conditioned by as our reality. So the real world isn't what we've been told the real world is. The real world is an untrust, unstable changing condition. As you grow older, you realize how unstable it is. All the changes, personal changes, or changes in climate, in, in uh, attitude, in generational changes, you know, that I can reflect back on. Where very conservative-minded people that don't want change want to take us back to a time where everything looked better than it does right now. Because we look, look into the future, climate change, political change, democracy is in, is in threat, and, and uh, the Russian war, and uh, pollution and and overpopulation all these are conditions that create worry and that's natural to worry about the future what are we going to do with with a, such a huge population of humans how are you going to feed them we don't want to take refugees in our country we want to keep the Mexicans out. <laughs> we, we don't, you know, we want to preserve what we have. We're afraid it'll change for the worse. So we become frightened and very selfish and ego-centered and prejudiced and narrow-minded through these fears, justified fears. But when we see that consciousness is unitive, then we share the same consciousness as all the refugees with everything, with the universe. Our refuge is totally perfect, but it includes everything and allows the changingness to be what it is as we trust in awareness. Then our lives, we learn, we have to learn from the way we are. You can't learn from the way I am or Ajahn Janto or somebody else. You've got to learn to be aware, just whatever you think of yourself, whatever you believe yourself to be, you know, it's not to affirm it, but to recognize it is a view an opinion, the beliefs you have. It's not that they're right or wrong, but they, they are beliefs. They're not Dhamma. And beliefs change. So then the freedom of enlightenment is knowing this, abiding in this awareness. And you, and, and, you know, it, it integrates, it, because it's here and now all the time, whatever the conditions are, then there's nothing to really do that you have to get but to trust in awareness and use your life, your memories, your emotional habits, your physical condition, as something to witness rather than to try to hold on to and identify with. 
So when we do that, then the human being, there's wisdom that operates through us rather than just prejudices, biases, cultural biases, religious biases, personal identities that we we hold to suddenly become objects uh, that are changing and our real refuge is in what is a true refuge, the Dhamma, the deathless reality that we are here and now. So I offer this as a reflection for this afternoon. <laughs> 